the sweet spot, I feel. Um, and there's various reasons for that. Um, so it's exciting to be here because the last time I spoke at Global Azure was about three years ago. It was during COVID. I was doing a presentation online. Uh, it was a live stream on YouTube. Um, the talk was only meant to go for an hour. And I ended up talking for two hours just at my own home kind of office. And I had no idea what you know, the time kind of thing. So whoever was on that live stream, I apologize. Um, three years ago, <laughs> this is not going to take two hours, I promise you. Um, so let's get straight into it. Okay, so today's journey, uh, we're going to look at the why, uh, why these two um, tools, essentially, so services, um, the various value propositions between the two as well. Um, so it's very very Azure-centric, very GitHub-centric, very code-centric talk. Um, I'm going to look at how we measure success you know, using these um, tools. I'm going to go into a demo of it, live demo. Um, so please, <laughs> uh, Q&A as well, we'll leave to the end. But um, again, yeah, there is swag left over. So if you have um, some good questions, some very um, you know, creative questions, please throw them out there. I'll, I'll look to uh, distribute this swag that we have left. Uh, who am I? So Jesse Loudon, I'm a consultant and tech stream lead um, in the Azure space for Arinco, who are a consultancy here in Sydney, uh, Melbourne, Brisbane, and New Zealand. And I'm an MVP in Azure. Uh, so I've been doing Azure work since 2018, roughly. Before then, I was kind of on-prem, VMware, Citrix, kind of sysadmin stuff. And um, there's my life at the uh, Women's Football World Cup last year when it was here. Um, that was a very rainy kind of um, uh, fixture. Uh, but the one after we went after that was Germany and Colombia. It was like amazing if you watch that game. And um, New Zealand, you know, adventure stuff. So I do a, a lot of activities, I guess, with the fam. And uh, so let's go into why Azure policy. Um, this is very much in the governance space of, you know, Azure. Um, overall, um, it is a free service. It's been very much free since day one, uh, with the exception of Azure Arc. And if you want to use Auto Manage or the the capabilities there um, for your Arc resources, um, so enterprise customers are absolutely on top of Azure Policy. If they're not, they're doing something wrong in most cases, um, simply because it's it's running as a service all the time. So any time there's any kind of API request or any deployment happening in Azure, policy is there to actually um, intercept that request, do an evaluation check, a compliance check, um, and really it's the last mile of protecting what you have in Azure against you know, misconfiguration, configuration drift, security gaps, um, you know, any kind of um, something that's been you know, gone past any review um, or any kind of um, you know, best practice kind of check, policy is really going to guard against that. Um, and when I first started talking about policy years ago, there were only about, I think, 1,500 policies available to use. Now you can see that number on point four there, and it's grown to around 3,000. Um, so that number is, I think, it, I feel like it's only going to continue to grow as more, as more you know, services and, and, um, and um, products are released to, to the Azure ecosystem. Um, the, the policy team and the team who are behind um, you know, creating policies and creating these governance guardrails, they're on. They're really at the at the heat of you know that that kind of um, movement to give businesses and organizations and 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 users and consumers of Azure that um, capability to manage their infrastructure at scale using a service like Policy. Um, so it's really grown. It's almost doubled in the last couple of years. Um, policy as well. It's getting a lot of investment. So this this uh, Diagram here is really what's called Enterprise Policy as Code. Um, it's become GA quite recently. Um, it is a public project um, developed by people internally at Microsoft. Um, and it is a way to orchestrate the policy management um, for your business or for your customer, um, which I like. I think that's brilliant. Um, it gives us a way to just forget about all the kind of pipeline-y stuff and all the how do we manage policy as code, because um, we should be doing policy as code. But how do we kind of, you don't have to worry about that too much because that project kind of takes care of that. What you do need to worry about, what I'll showcase uh, later on this session, is how we can get into the real 
you know, nitty gritty of value add with policy. And that really comes down to the definition. So what is this business logic uh, behind the definitions that are being assigned to your, your environments, right? What are these definitions doing? How do we improve them? How do we refactor them? How do we bring new definitions to govern our environments um, across the board? So um, it's, a, it's a gap. It's a gap that I want to address. Um, it's an ongoing gap, um, but it's there. Uh, so last, the last thing there is being able to govern both Azure. So policy can govern both Azure and your on-prem environment through Azure Arc. Uh, Azure Arc is, um, is able to actually connect through the Azure Arc agent, connect to your on-prem uh, virtual machines um, to be governed by Azure policy, which sits in Azure, of course. So that you know, extends out the, um, the actual uh, coverage, I guess. Um, so if you've got hybrid environments, if you've got customers or you've got you know, infrastructure that's there and you're not sure if you want to use group policy still. Maybe you are using group policy, Active Directory for GPs. Um, policy can kind of come into play with, you know, replacing what you had already in terms of governance and guardrails um, and provide that kind of standardized um, approach. So the value prop with Azure policy, um, if you didn't already get the point from the previous slide, these are all the kind of common use cases really across the board. And, and there's a lot more that are not listed here, but we can do a lot of things with resource monitoring, data protection, network is quite key as well, uh, regulatory compliance and, and just general governance like you know, preventing um, over, um, over uh, what do you call, you know, high, high expensive SKUs from being used like premium SKUs and um, uh, the kind of costly um, deployments that can kind of go unchecked and then they consume all your um, all your credits that you might have um, if you're if you're on a, like a pay-as-you-go subscription kind of deal um, tagging of course is a very common use case with policy as well so copilot this has absolutely blown the the water like the developers out of the water with regards to how they normally use um, their normal work to do, you know, day-to-day -day work, working with Azure policy, working with code. Um, previously, you know, ChatGPT, of course, has been around a lot longer, but GitHub Copilot, I've used it now for about eight months. Um, and throughout Arinco as well, we've had about 20 licenses. It's heavily, heavily contested where, you know, 20 licenses between 100 consultants there's a shortage. So anytime there's a license free, <laughs> we're all like, ah, oh, give me a license. I need, I need to use Copilot. And it becomes like muscle memory. The more you use it, the more you're familiar you are with it and how to get the best out of it. Um, so it's, it really, for me, it's contributing to my productivity because I know how to use it. How, I know how to get the best out of it. And I know its limitations. Um, it's not the silver bullet where it's going to basically take over what I'm doing. But as an assistant, Copilot has really uh, helped me to do things in the editor, right? In Visual Studio Code, whatever. I'm, I'm doing, you know, uh, uplifts there in code. I'm doing refactoring. I'm doing new development for um, features and, and policies in general as well. So Copilot has, um, has changed the way I work. Um, and it's got IDE support, so all the common IDEs, of course. And uh, investing in new, you know, the Copilot team and Microsoft invest in new uh, features and tools like Copilot Enterprise, which gives you, um, you know, that Copilot within uh, your browser, essentially, if you're on GitHub. Um, chat as well as is GA, CLI is great if you work in CLI as, as a lot as well. So that is expanding. Um, that's the current kind of state. What comes next out of like the GitHub team and Microsoft? I don't really know, but they have big plans for it, um, which is exciting. And um, the training, so the, the actual training for GitHub Copa is on all the GitHub repositories at a point in time. I think it was from like um, 2019 or something, 2018, 2019. So it's been trained on a lot of data from GitHub, which is specifically to, to provide that, um, you know, that uh, assistant that is purely for coding, purely for, you know, things that developers do day in, day out with uh, different languages, whether it's, you know, Node.js, um, .NET, or, you know, in the infrastructure side, there's Bicep and Terraform and all that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's kind of like why Copilot in a nutshell, the value proposition that they're bringing is all these points here um, kind of summarized to, to really go through what do we, what do we, what can we do with Copilot, right? 
so we can get code completion. Like a lot of this, I'm going to go through in my demo. Um, so how it works is, you know, um, that context is sent from your editor, from the files you have open. It's sent to the Copilot language uh, model um, in, in in GitOps backend. Um, they then they then they then analyze that and then send you back a suggestion. So Copilot's sole job is to um, give you a suggestion, and that suggestion may be great, it may be not so great. <laughs> But we'll use our critical thinking to actually look at, you know, what are we getting back? Is this useful to us? Um, can it help me? And in most cases, from what I found, uh, it does actually help uh, in, in terms of what I'm doing day to day, uh, which is a plus. Otherwise, I wouldn't be speaking about it here. Um, it also can help with explaining. So let's say, you know, you step into a new code base. You have no idea about it. Um, you're very particular about what you need to fix in terms of you know, what is the problem statement. So you go to that file and you have to like read every single line or the, try and ascertain what are the important parts of this file that I need to worry about. Um, Copilot can just really quickly look at that context and then give you a summary to, um, to bring it you know, uh, in terms of like these, this is how this file works in the context of the project. Um, and these are the important points you need to worry about, the, the parameters, the inputs, the outputs. Um, the naming kind of thing as well. So that's, that's nice. Refactoring as well, I'll show you some of that. Um, so all this kind of combined together means that we, we don't have to use Copilot for specifically one of these, but in a developer's day-to-day, -day, they're, you know, they're gonna be doing code completion most often. They, they might jump into a bit of explaining. They might do a bit of refactoring. Um, there are options there to get the most out of Copilot depending on what you're doing. Um, and I'll show you a bit as well in terms of the success factors as well, how it comes into it. So the key question I asked myself when I was you know, looking at this talk and how I'm going to um, uh, deliver a message really or try to bring value to, to everyone who's, um, who's a part of this is, the question is how useful is this tool um, for Azure policy? Now you can, you can kind of remove the word Azure policy here and just replace that with whichever language or whatever you know, code base that you have in mind for your own customer or your own project, because the concepts that I'm talking about here um, are kind of universal between not just Azure policy, but they're universal between uh, other languages and other things that you're doing as a developer, as a, um, as a consumer of, um, of code, right? Um, so I've chosen Azure policy specifically because that's kind of my love child. Um, I like talking about it. Um, but yeah, this, this message is very much, um, meant to be um, consumed across many different um, types. So I've come up with like a, a list of measurement criteria, right? So how are we gonna evaluate this? How useful is this tool? Um, so against you know, what I showed you before in terms of the value proposition, there's a couple of capabilities I put on the left here, and then we'll go through a bit of test uh, results in terms of how I'm using it in the demos. Um, they could be a pass, they might be a fail. There's a lot of you know, different factors I'll go into as well. So these are the factors that are really important. I came up with this list myself just based on what I know about using this tool. Um, I'm interested to hear as well if you have, if you're a user of GitHub Copilot today, do you have other factors that are maybe not listed here? Um, but essentially the top one there, developer experience level. Like you're, if you're very junior at what you're doing in terms of that code base and language and never, you've never touched you know, that particular language and you don't really know, like maybe you're just starting out um, GitHub Copilot can still help. However, it's going to be difficult to get the most out of it because you kind of need to prompt it. You need to give it, you know, the right questions, and and that will drive um, the assistant out of Copilot to give you something uh, that you need to progress what you're doing. So, uh, you know, compare that to a senior dev, someone who's been working in that field a while. They've seen a lot. They've, you know, they've experienced, you know, good and bad out of um, different patterns and different optimization methods and you know, they've seen different things that work, different things that don't. What they get from the back in terms of the response from the AI, um, they can quickly analyze that and say, that's useful, or that's, that's absolutely missed the mark <laughs> straight away. Um, problem complexity level as well. If you throw a huge problem at Copilot and it's like, you know, you're just overloading it with so many things it needs to think about uh, in terms of the, um, in terms of the um, generating response for you, um, it's probably not going to be able to meet every single requirement that you have in that problem statement. Um, so in those cases, if you have a big problem to solve, maybe it's a migration of code, 
between code bases, maybe it's a big refactor. Um, you just want to you know, tailor that down to more bite-sized um, problems. Um, chip away at it, be a bit more iterative rather than just say, Copilot, I need you to refactor this entire code base, that code base that's been around for like five years um, rather than that. So um, quality of prompts as well. You know, there's probably been some talks earlier today about prompt engineering, and um, you've probably seen some of that as well. Um, that's definitely a factor. You know, if, you, if you're very high level in your prompt to Copilot, which I'll show you in a bit, um, you'll probably get a high level response back. Um, so specific, being specific about your um, ask is, is great, it's a big tick. And available examples, if you're working on something uh, kind of nuanced and niched, um, Copilot will, um, will tend to not uh, uh, be able to find you know, something like that um, in terms of the answer for you. So in, th in those cases where you're not getting, it's completely missed the mark in terms of what you're asking it, you just need to find an example or create an example, give that to Copilot, um, and, and that should get you on your way. So all that, um, I think I've, I've actually ranked that in terms of what I feel like are the contributing factors to how you use and get the most out of it. But yeah, I'm definitely keen to hear if there's anything else I've missed there. All right, so let's do a bit of a road test. Um, this is a, a project I've had going. Um, it's called Azure Policy as Code. It's in GitHub. I've had this going for, what's the first commit there? Three years ago. So that's roughly the time I did my first global Azure talk. Um, and I'm revisiting now. <laughs> I'm revisiting it as part of this talk because um, it is out, out of date. So I need to do a bit of refactoring. I need to do a bit of uplift. Um, and I like since I first worked on this code base, there's things that have changed. You know, there's, there's, um, there's new best practices, there's new capabilities out of Azure policy. Um, so this is gonna be interesting. Uh, and then after that, we will we'll get to this bit in, about, in terms of how Copilot uh, did and was hopefully effective. Um, so there we go. So there's my editor. I've got my, my project um, local, synced local. And I've got a couple extensions installed. I've got GitHub Copilot, and I've got GitHub Copilot chat. So this is Visual Studio Code, of course, um, very lightweight editor. Um, I've got the latest versions of everything, so hopefully, hopefully things are going to work. Um, so here, I've got some bicep um, code. So bicep being just the orchestrator out of you know, like I've talked about um, Enterprise Policy as Code, that project from Microsoft, Bicep here is just doing the orchestration of policies as code to our environment. So um, I've got an example here on Terraform as well. If you're a Terraform-like um, Terraform um, person, um, Terraform enthusiast. So with Bicep, right, um, now this refactor work I've been doing I've got a folder here called definitions. So remember I was talking about the value prop for Azure policy, um, like completely forget about all the other stuff, all the noise, um, the real value and it comes from the business logic that we bake into these policy definitions. Um, so there's a lot of definitions that are available from Microsoft, they're called built-in definitions. Um, so those are available for every customer, you can just select them straight from the Azure portal and deploy them out and you're good to go. But as we found with actually using Azure Policy, there's a lot of times you need to customize those definitions. You need to bring in your own like customer-specific logic um, in terms of their naming standards, in terms of their compliance, you know, regulatory standards, and what they want as a as a outcome. So this is where I store the custom definitions in this folder in this um, repo. And the first one on the list here is about um, it's really about governing the um, activity logs. Um, for a specific resource called uh, Azure Firewall. So this, um, this is kind of a, a typical policy definition, right? It's in JSON language, JavaScript object notation, um, and GitHub is active, right? So anytime I'm doing things in, in this file right now, um, GitHub is actually kind of trying to predict what I'm about to do next. Um, so if I'm, if I'm adding something here, so right now I've got a parameter called enabled, uh, I might add a new parameter here. There's one for effect. So here, if I look at this, um, the policy rule. So policy policy works in terms of like there's an if statement in terms of 
what is it that I need to check in Azure? So the if statement tells um, Azure policy, this is what I'm going to um, uh, evaluate. So right now it's Azure firewalls, as you can see there. So, um, and then there's a then statement just, just a bit below that, and that's the actual action, whether it's a deny action, whether it's a modify or a deploy action to, do, to actually remediate the non-compliance. So I'm going to add something here. I want to add, um, I want to add a check on, you know, I only want to do this for Azure firewalls that are of a standard SKU. So I kind of want to add more logical layers to this policy. So it's not just going to apply this um, activity log alert to all firewalls. Maybe I just want, you know, um, I would just want this for a particular SKU of Azure firewall. So I, I probably could actually just start typing here and just add a new block there and you can see that actually did you miss that but it was just actually just a ghost text suggestion i'll do it again um, from github copilot um, once i actually start typing there we go so it's this is completely wrong you know i don't want to add <laughs> i don't want to add a field check in there for monitor alerts exclusion um, i've already got that directly below that because um, that's a tag check in there essentially so Copilot, it's, like I said, it's always just trying to give you an answer. Um, so what I want to do is um, I could just start typing what I want to what I want to do here. But what I'm actually better to do is give a prompt. So I'm going to add a um, check if Azure Firewall SKU is equal to standard. So I added a comment or a prompt um, to my file. And the reason it's red highlighted is because my file is JSON. Um, so it needs to be JSON C for JSON comments for that to be valid, but that's fine. Copilot doesn't care about that. So I'm just going to go to the next line. And there we go. So now my actual suggestion from Copilot is like a lot more useful there. Um, so it's chosen the right field for SKU. Um, and it's, it's hard coded that to standard um, because I didn't specify in my prompt that I want to use a parameter input for this SKU. But if I did, it would actually just it would actually just suggest that as a parameter input for that, like next to where it says equals there. Um, so that's very useful, and you can see how I got to that outcome just by providing that you know specific prompt to what I'm looking for. So if I wanted to accept that, I would just tab, press tab on my keyboard, and there we go. Um, I've I pretty much just yeah. So I pretty much just uplifted that. Now um, now that's. That's kind of like you know day-to-day -day coding, right? You may provide a prompt, you may not. Copilot may give you a suggestion that works, it may not. Yep. Yeah. So it's based on the file language that uh, the file you have open. So right now, um, what I have open the file is JSON. Um, so as a, you can see in the editor, it's got um, JSON there. So Copilot. It takes the context of like the file extension, um, and then it knows. Okay, that's the language you're you're. Well, it's different. Yeah. It, so JSON is it's used in a lot of different places. Azure Policy actually has a very specific uh, schema, um, a JSON specific schema. So. Um, uh, there are things uh, that are policy specific um, for that that need to be valid against that schema. Um, if I'm working in a bicep file um, and I'm doing JSON in bicep, that's another story. Um, so I need to be very, I need to give it like you know a, a kind of window of this is what exactly what I'm doing in that bicep file that is JSON. And I'm not sure I haven't actually tested that one yet. <laughs> Um, but generally, it just takes the context of like your open file at the at the time that you're working, um, and I haven't run into it any issues where it's given me like the wrong language completely from you know uh, compared to what I actually need. So yeah, it, it's it's kind of smart like that, uh, which is great. Um, so one question. Yeah. So ARM template also has a similar syntax, so will it work in the same way as the other one? It will, yeah. It will work, yeah. So, like the key things are like determining those contributing factors. If there is data that Copilot has been trained on, and ARM templates, I know there has lots of data in GitHub from when Copilot was trained. It can provide suggestions to you when you're working in ARM templates, right? But if there's no, if you're working on a very niche kind of language or 
technology, maybe not a lot of data in GitHub. Um, you may need to provide examples uh, to Copilot to actually give it a bit of a leg up, you know, in terms of this is what the, you know, the kind of pattern of this um, uh, code base is. This is what you might uh, use for, um, uh, for, for these kind of scenarios, yeah, and, and use cases as well. But yes, yeah, very good question. So, so uh, ARM templates uh, do use JSON as well. Bicep language builds on ARM templates. Um, I find Bicep to be much better to work in, uh, in terms of, you know, if I was to choose between ARM templates and Bicep. The reason I'm using JSON now for the, is because it's a definition. So policy definition, all this kind of like, if then, uh, you know, this kind of policy specific schema, it's really ugly to work with this kind of language in Bicep language. Um, it's really hard. You have to like do a lot of escape, escaping for the characters. You need to, yeah, it's a hybrid kind of like, it's a hybrid experience and we hate that as a developer because you have to kind of like think in two minds, am I working in Bicep? Am I working in policy? It's gonna vary depending on what you're um, doing in that file. So that's why we like, as a policy dev, we like to keep our definitions as vanilla as possible in the original like language which is JSON. Uh, it's a bit ugly, um, <laughs> but it's the, close, it's the closest thing you get to um, something that will work. And yeah, the least, least amount of effort as well. Like you can copy a, a policy straight from the portal, um, straight into like a JSON file in your code base uh, to manage it as policy code. And you can just do a few edits and you're done. You don't need to do a lot of refactoring. So um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Copilot can do unit testing or writing, can't do, it can execute the test for you. <laughs> it can help you to write the test, uh, yes. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I actually haven't tested that with policy. I would be interested to ask Copilot right now if, if it can write me a unit test for it. So I'm gonna use Copilot chat for this because um, I, have, I have used Copilot to um, create tests for like Python. Uh, seems very good at that because there's a lot of Python data in GitHub. So for policy, I'm interested in JSON specifically create a unit test. I'm gonna prompt Copilot to create a unit test for the open JSON policy definition. Interested to see how it um, suggests um, I do that, um, like in terms of the test format. Yeah, it's suggesting Python. <laughs> so it's suggesting to, um, to test this in Python. There we go. On, yeah, yeah. So it's got the context of my policy definition there in JSON, and um, and it is it's created a unit test for me. Um, so it's saying uh, policy definition load this, load this, and there is my edit. You can see it's got that that recent edit I did for the firewall SKU. So it has brought that in, um, and then it's got some very um, basic uh, tests defined there. So, but what it hasn't told me is how I run that test, right? So I could actually prompt it here. How, how, do, how do I run this test? And, and it will give me, it should give me some like, you know, um, some steps basically, um, and what libraries, if any, for Python and modules I'll, I'll need to install. So this is a JSON file. Yes, yes. Okay. So um, yes, it can definitely, Copilot can definitely help you create tests. It, it won't help you um, run them, but it will give you steps um, to execute on those. Um, Copilot can also do like documentation. So um, can you create a readme to document the open JSON file? So I'm gonna keep referencing this JSON file just to go through this. Um, so here, here's a sample readme that documents the JSON file, uh, and it will have all the elements. This is, this is pretty accurate. Uh, so parameters, those are all the parameters, the policy rule, um, but that is pretty basic, you know, but it is a starting point. The thing with Copilot is if, you are, if you've got like that, that creative block in terms of like, what do I need to do next, or I don't know where to start, Copilot can really get you on your way as a developer because it can give you some boilerplate, you know, some, some 
um, some documentation or some ideas about, okay, you know, based on that, I can then improve this, or based on this, I can just you know iterate and, and make this better. Um, otherwise, you have to kind of go and you know kind of sometimes reinvent the wheel um, to get things going, and you lose momentum in those cases. So, developer flow and you know developer productivity. I feel like when I'm using Copilot, if I've if I if I'm stuck, um, I can ask it for help, or I can just you know keep going through different prompts to try and get the result that I'm um, I'm actually looking for to progress. Um, yeah, yeah, you can ask it like you know I'll do something incorrect here and actually see if it if it can pick it, pick it up. But before that, I will actually ask Copilot. So, um, can you suggest improvements? Improvements to the open JSON file. Um, it will give me some improvements. It always gives you a response. Um, I've, every time I've asked this of Copilot, it's never come back and said, "No, your your code is perfect. Your code is perfect. You don't need to do anything." Um, never the case. It's always suggesting things. Um, so you need to take that with like you know a view of is this something I need to do? Is this valuable? Right? Critical thinking. Um, so here it's saying add descriptive comments. Um, yep, I've got no comments in my code except that one I used for the demo. Uh, consistent naming, Copilot actually, so it's suggesting I need consistent naming, um, but it hasn't told me where I have inconsistent naming in my file. So that to me looks like it's something it's kind of generically providing all the time rather than just linking it to what specifically is wrong with my file. Um, but yes, naming is important. You know, if you have a code base which has very wild, <laughs> inconsistent naming from a lot of different people editing that over years and years, um, that's going to be probably giving you some um, messy results from using Copilot on it. So try and fix up the naming if you can. Make it consistent across your functions, your variables, your parameters, and things, and resources. Um, and yeah, this, so this is an example. You can take those. Um, you can take those suggestions if you wanted to. Um, and also times when I've used Copilot, um, it has also suggested what you can do to uplift your code as well. Um, this time it didn't, though, because it is a probabilistic model, which means every time you prompt Copilot, it's not going to be the same response. You know, I've, I've had responses before where it's actually given me a, um, like a JSON representation of what I could basically just copy that into my file to uplift it. Based on the improvement, uh, this time it didn't. So, so I will. I'll now ask it. Okay, can uh, can you fix? All right. I'll I'll have to give it a problem. I'll have to break something. Right. So, let me break something here. Uh, and there we go. I broke, I broke JSON because I removed a comma. <laughs> if you've used JSON, you know the commas are extremely, yeah. Um, so I've broken it. Now I'm going to ask Copilot, can you fix the open? Uh... Let's see if it picks up um, what I've done. Yeah, so it said um, the, the, the file provided is missing a comma. So it has picked that up. It's, it's kind of good at reading that, I guess, because of the language. Um, there's lots of examples. And you can see the inline uh, suggestion as well in terms of like, you know, here's what you need to copy exactly to fix it. Um, so what I did, you know, where I, where I actually deleted that comma was here on line 89. Um, and its suggestion there has the comma um, for the fix as well. So thumbs up, that is accurate uh, in terms of fixing that particular piece. Um, I'll show you something here as well that was interesting. So if I, if I wanted to, so this is a role definition ID uh, block. So with Azure Policy, when it's doing remediation actions or effects, it needs permission in Azure against that resource. So think of RBAC, think of like contributor access, um, you know, that kind of thing. So this is where we define what, does, what is the identity for the Azure Policy uh, need in terms of modifying the resource to remediate it. So it's got two role definitions there. They're reference GUIDs. You know, you, if, unless you're working in this area a lot, you're not going to recognize these GUIDs. Um, but I, rec I know one GUID in particular, so I'm going to test Copilot here. I'm going to say um, add role definition for contributor uh, RBAC 
access. Let's see if it can give me the right uh, role definition. So my, that's my prompt there. And I'll just go to the next line. And I might need to, there we go. So, um, so the, the suggestion there, um, because it, it ends in that uh, D24C in the terms of the GUID here, if I just search, I might just, just validate this. Um, R back built in roles. So I'm going to go into the RBAC knowledge base from Microsoft. I'm just going to validate this GUID. Um, I'm pretty sure this is contributor, but if I'm if I'm wrong, then yeah. So this is the contributor um, built-in role, and um, so somewhere in Copilot's data from like when it's been trained on GitHub, um, there must have been some sort of like mapping that it found, you know, contributor to this particular GUID. Um, but that is an accurate one. So I, I basically just brought that in because no one remembers GUIDs. You're not meant to remember them. Um, you know, but I, that particular one I do remember because it's just used in so many different places. I know it ends in D24C. Um, so I know that's accurate, um, and I could prompt Copilot to bring that in as a role definition. Other, other things we can do with Copilot, uh, we can have... Can it add comments? It can add comments. Um, and the interesting thing about that is, um, so that's kind of like documentation, right? Comments are like documenting your code. Um, you'll notice I don't have any comments in this. Um, but what I could do, and this is, this is quite magical actually, is if I start um, giving a pattern of commenting my code, like I'm starting to comment this code right now, Copilot is going to see that as a thing to do. And then when I keep commenting my code, it's going to actually suggest the comments for me. So it's actually self-learning you know, based on the work I'm doing in the file, which is pretty cool. It saved me a lot of time over, like, over the many minutes and hours that I spend commenting code. Um, so if I say, you know, um, for instance, under, so some things that might typically not have comments, for example, um, excludes excludes firewalls that have uh, the, there we go. So um, I started typing this comment here um, just to kind of explain that um, block from line 78 downwards. Um, and the ghost text there is this AI suggestion, essentially, that it's saying, you know, it's kind of completing what I was going to write, which is pretty cool, um, because it has the context of, like, how is this parameter used in the code base? Um, so that has definitely saved me a lot of time, uh, and I can accept that one and move on. Uh, another example might be uh, role definitions, IDs for the policy to deploy the alert. There we go. There's another AI suggested uh, comment that I can accept. So I, as I keep rolling through that, the Copa is basically going to get smarter. You know, it's going to pick up on my my kind of um, developer type um, nuances, like what I accept as a comment, how detailed I am. Um, so the the more you use Copilot, the more it learns from you, you know, like your particular habits as a developer, whether you name things well or you know how descriptive you are in your comments. It actually it's actually using that as um, context to what to suggest to you as well. So going back to my contributing factors, I was talking about you know the the seniority of your developer that's using the tool that will play a part. Um, if someone's really you know, um, experienced, they know exactly what they want, they've been through this many times, Copa is just gonna use that as a ball of momentum to just you know, give you things you know, as you're working in, it, in the editor or in your file, and you can use that really great. But if you're not so senior, that's fine too, because you can, you can kind of learn what is good, what, what is not good, at the same time as using the AI. You just need to pare back your expectations a bit because you know, um, maybe, maybe you don't know what you're doing, and the AI doesn't know what it's doing in that particular language. So you kind of need to work together to achieve the result, which kind of means move, moving slower, doing more testing, doing more validation, you know, like I showed you with this, you know, suggested role definition ID. I knew that ID was the contributor ID because I've seen that so many times. If I didn't know that and Copilot had suggested that to me, um, you know, I need to go check what that ID is. 
see here it suggested a different ID because I didn't prompt it to bring in that contributor uh, role. So it's a completely different GU GUID here. So I, I would want to go and check that to validate it is accurate. Um, and that goes with any kind of copilot, kind of AI, you know, um, uh, usage. Fine tuning. So, um, if you're doing this in Copilot chat, um, so I've, I've been showing you a lot outside of chat, but if you're doing a lot of that uh, conversational uh, type prompting in chat, um, you can you can fine tune uh, the responses in a sense that you know maybe maybe you didn't um, or you want to go back to the history of like what you prompted it. You can actually delete you know different prompts like this one here. I could delete that. Because maybe that was not intended, or maybe it's giving you know Copilot the wrong idea. Um, so that's kind of the fine tuning you can do within the chat UI. Um, and uh, I have had heard feedback as well, like Copilot is still giving me the wrong response, even though I've given it a lot of examples and a lot of context on what I'm looking for for a particular language. Um, so Copilot chat specifically. And um, what I what I found out of that problem statement is. Um, you like you know you're working towards a goal to solve a problem with coding. Um, when Copilot's providing you suggestions, you should probably be updating your file that you've got open as well at the same time, um, because that is context that's feeding back into the AI. Um, so um, in that particular case, I think you know the developer was not updating the file as they were getting suggestions, and so Copilot was kind of just lost in a sense of like, you know, am I providing good uh, responses? Um, so that that was something that was, you know, um, I think a a, a good um, good way of working with Copilot as well. If you want to, you know, get the fine tuning going and get it um, working better with with your particular use cases. Can All help, right. Can I hop in quickly? Yeah. Just on the right hand side in the editor, see where it's got those yellow yellow sparkles on that yes. line. Where you just click on that for a second. Yes. Okay. So you can. One of the options in Copilot, it's not in that menu probably because it's just a comment, is it will actually give you multiple suggestions. So it'll give you the most likely suggestion as the default that it inserts into the editor. But you can then actually open an additional dialogue and get other suggestions. So I think Jesse probably can show you how that works. So that's also, it's not really fine tuning per se, but it is kind of saying I'm more interested in these sorts of answers than I am you know, the default answer that you gave me. And it is ultimately going to be driven a lot by what is in the context window that you've got open in the editor at that point. Yeah. Uh, I always forget how to get that experience to render, but there is a way to actually, in the editor, get it to show like multiple suggestions. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. Um, let me try. With I think it's control, control I, do control I. There's like a shortcut, and then you can uh, ask ask it to do something, and then one of the options is other suggestions. Oh, add logic check for if Azure file. Let me see through this control I experience. So I'm doing a prompt add logic check for if Azure firewall is in Australia East. I'm going to do a region prompt. Um, uh, so here we go. Generate. Okay. And then I think there is an option there. Uh, so you've got accept or discard. Accept or discard. Yeah, and I think there's mate, there's like you've got thumbs up, thumbs down, and yeah. re, re, uh, redo. Regenerate, yeah. Yeah. So the challenge you have with Copilot is the way the ID represents it changes quite a bit over time. Yep. Like it's always an experience that it's like, oh, today Copilot behaves slightly differently in the IDE. <laughs> yeah. Because there's, no, always, yeah. there's always things happening in the back end. If, yeah, I think here if there was more than one response, I might be able to like flick through the, the possibilities. Um, right now there's just one response and I can, I, I can either accept that or discard that. Um, yeah. I mean that looks pretty accurate in terms of the actual response though. Um, not sure if anyone is... is uh, ARM template region. Um, so, so yeah, control I, pro tip, control I, you can also 
uh, you can also prompt it through that rather than writing a comment. So that was the difference, right? Before I was writing a comment and then I was going to the next line and waiting, I guess, for the copilot to then give me that ghost text. Um, control I is a different, a cool one. And I've also used, um, I've also used this voice chat thing, which is interesting. So if I start voice chat, is this, his voice, is it listening? Start voice chat, hi voice, yeah, his voice, no. Uh, generate, generate copilot, oh, I have to click that. Generate logic. Uh, two click. No. Generate logic check for if Azure Firewall is in. Okay, I stopped a bit. Um, but it, it voice does work. I have used it. If you get a bit lazy, um, you want to try something a bit different. <laughs> uh, you're tired of typing. You've got that what RSI thing going on. With, uh, with endless typing and Teams chats. Um, voice is interesting. It's an interesting capability. Um, so that, that is there as well, which is cool. You know? um, Copilot can also generate documentation, which I showed you. Um, and it has, yeah, it has a lot of cool stuff built into it. I haven't shown you the CLI stuff. I haven't shown you Enterprise. Um, if you're interested in any of that, hit me up, because I've got examples of how it's used. That's right. So that comes to like the complexity thing, right? If I ask it to generate documentation for like 50 files or an entire file that I've got open, it's probably going to fall over and give me something like. Yeah. 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 So make yeah make docs um, that that one as well. Lots of good um, lots of good documentation generation um, tools out there as well. Now. Just wary of time, and I'm now going to swap back to. So, does it work only with the internet? Or? Does it work only with internet? Yeah. I think yes. I yes. think because it's sending, yeah, it's sending your context um, over the wire to the backend um, in your tenancy or wherever the backend is, like it's as a service. So. It needs internet. You know, it needs to be able to talk to the back end. Um, that back end is not hosted on your device. Um, you only have the client extension through Visual Studio Code. So if you have a choppy internet connection, bad latency, drop packets, um, your response from Copilot is going to be delayed. Yeah. If, if you've got a if you've got a developer desktop that can run the open AI models, I need to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Converting? That's, <laughs> I get that a lot in terms of like, can I change from one language, like legacy code base to another language with Copilot? Yes, you can. Um, so class, like one I've done before is um, migrating from Azure DevOps YAML pipelines to GitHub Actions YAML uh, workflows. Um, if I gave it the entire file to migrate and refactor, it would just give me some rubbish. I needed to split that up into smaller requests. And this will probably go for any kind of like code migration or refactoring from one language to another. You need to, you need to start small. Um, and also, if you don't have a, a, an end state in terms of like your file that you're expecting in, terms, in, in that destination language, Copilot may not be aligning to your standards, right? Because you, you probably want to give it that template and example first to, to show it and have that open as context so it knows, OK, this is what I'm expecting in terms of variables, parameters, Etc. Naming standards. Um, so try and build like a skeleton, I guess, in terms of what I'm migrating to, and then start the process of taking small bits of your original code and asking the AI to give you a response. Um, but it is not a migration tool. There are migration tools out there, like similar to the documentation thing. There's documentation tools out there that are very good. Um, it's one of the capabilities it can do, though. Um, so so how did how did Copilot go for code completion? You know, that was pretty much a pass, right? Um, explaining, it, it did explain, it did explain the code. Refactoring, I did I do any refactoring? I don't really not 
I didn't refactor anything. We did have a conversation, uh, which is great. Debugging, it did help to find that you know, missing comma, um, which would have broken uh, the entire definition. Generation of boilerplates, I did, did I show you that? Um, I did show you a bit of like how it can generate a readme file, which is a bit of the documentation thing. Um, but boilerplate is one of those use cases like you can prompt Copa to create a new project for a particular language like you know, .NET, Python, and it will give you the scaffolding for that. It will give you the file structure um, just as a starting point. You, know, you probably don't want to go with that because there's a lot of things you want to do in terms of uh, naming and best practices, but it will generate that for you as a starting point. Um, so we didn't specifically test that. Um, tests, we did, we did go through. Uh, and questions? We've had some good questions. Uh, was there anything else? Uh, you may still be eligible for swag if you have a good question. <laughs> yes? So on the percentage, how much time saving developers can have using Copilot on a weekly basis? So time, time saving wise, let me go to Let's let's sit on this one for a bit while we answer this. So, um, time saving wise, like my own experience with Copilot, if I'm doing things that have a pattern, like in a pattern of use and repetitive, repetitive in nature, right? I'm doing the same thing. It's very you know very um, boring. <laughs> Copilot has been great at helping me with that um, because it can see a pattern, it can see what I'm doing, it's easy to predict what's coming next. If it's something very niche and a once-off and it doesn't have a lot of um, examples of what you're trying to work on for that particular problem domain and, and, and language, um, Copilot tends to fall over because it just needs a lot more um, it needs a lot more from you to be able to, to give you an outcome. So in those cases, I've actually had to spend more time helping Copilot understand the problem <laughs> um, rather than actually fixing the problem. So, um, so you know, I think you know that's that's really where it comes into it. Like you know, things that are repetitive, you're going to save a lot of time. Things that um, are very niche in nature, Copilot is probably not the right tool, but it can still help once you get an established pattern going for that particular type of work. Yeah. So it kind of feeds into all these things as well. And I think it's, I think it's also, we often think about um, productivity boosters just a metric, right? Like, let's say more lines of code, say 20% more lines of code or 10% more features in the sprint. There's actually, um, the way GitHub looks at this and they've published either both some white papers and some blogs based on those white papers is it's, not just productivity, but it's also job satisfaction because this sort of tooling, as I'm sure Jesse's shown you, takes away some of the drudgery, right? Like some of those boilerplate text, the documentation, finding bugs. So there is there are some numbers that are published, but obviously they're going to vary based on scenario. And I think um, adoption, the way you adopt it, like turning it on and giving it to developers is not a recipe for success because a lot of people are rightfully skeptical about the benefits and maybe even worried for their jobs. So, you know, we see a lot of people needing handholding to get the most out of the tool, like any tool. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I, yeah, sorry. Context, um, you know, out of context, you basically have to type and regenerate some code or one shot, one shot. One shot, yeah, yeah. And it quickly ran out of context, very quickly. Yeah. Well, which yeah I think I think in that in that case that's that's really it just doesn't have like was this a was this an edge like language like in terms of C sharp yeah I think I think in that case you really need to be firm about like is Copa going to work in this scenario um, because you know it's a probabilistic model so you don't get the same result every time but if what you're doing is not working um, you either keep going with copilot for that particular um, you know uh, need or you, you go back to whatever you did before um, I think it I think you know I've found cases where copilot was giving me incorrect information you know because it's hallucinating 
something that's not right. And I've had to really apply, you know, uh, apply a thought process to that. Like, should I still continue on what I'm doing with this? Um, it's going to vary, certainly. I think the context there, if you're giving it examples and it still cannot get the right, you know. Did a few, yeah. Like yeah. But, so I think we've got. Sorry to cut you off. So I think this gentleman here already qualified for a piece of swag because he asked the question that we were talking about. So we'll come and see him afterwards. That's right. And I've got another question back down here, Jesse. Um, yeah, I was just going to say uh, Microsoft themselves with Copilot says we call it Copilot, not Autopilot. Um, and they're like, yeah, don't, don't rely on it to do your work for you. It's an assistant sitting next to you giving you suggestions. It's your job to take them and to either reject them the or driver. accept them yeah, or, or whatever, yeah. which is really important. And then the, the second thing is also that um, uh, there's this question that comes up about, you know, are developers, specifically like junior developers, going to be out of a job with things like um, Copilot coming through? Yeah. And the answer is not necessarily but your job goes from being a junior developer to a mid or a senior level developer because your job becomes code reviewing, not writing low level code. So the idea is that Copilot can write, you know, boilerplate templates yep. and code suggestions and fixes and refactoring, but it's your job to review them, figure out if they're safe and effective and if they meet the context and everything else, and then to apply it or to reject it and say, no, 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 that's going to cause a security vuln or you know that's going to conflict with this other bit of code that we've got, or that's not how we do things in our organization. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. then to guide it. So, if anything, I like speaking to customers who have adopted Copilot. I'm hearing the I'm hearing the same thing. You know, it, it's really um, it's really surfaced up that um, we need to be more aware of how we review code. Now that there's a lot of AI generated code out there. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, maybe it doesn't align to our organizational standards and best practices. It's really firmed up you know, the, the need for good reviewing and how to review and what is acceptable, right? Um, so yes, very good point. If you have it documented. Do you have it documented? Do you have it in a documentation format like Markdown? Yeah. If you have a documentation repo um, that is the home of all your organizational coding standards and best practices and security standards, Copilot can read that and use that to, um, to better provide a response that it's in line with that. But you need to have it documented. Yeah. yeah, and it needs to be, that's the enterprise feature set. GitHub Copilot Enterprise. So business won't do that for you. Business is the client client app stuff. Uh, look, I'm conscious we are a, yes. a bit over time. Um, I think Jesse's got some swag. Um, if you do want a pair of socks, a cool hat, uh, or a hoodie, and the hoodie I've got multiple sizes, so um, if the it's a medium, but if you need bigger or smaller, let me know and I can change it. Um, look at this gentleman here. He's gonna, you're going to be dressed head to toe with swag from today. It's amazing. It's amazing.